Today's episode of A New Beginning is brought to you by Harvest Partners, helping people everywhere know God. Learn more at harvest.org. And while you're there, browse our library of free ebooks designed to help you grow in your faith. Why don't we pray more often? Maybe we don't pray more because we think we don't have the time. We're all pressed for time, right? Never can get it all done. But coming up today on A New Beginning, Pastor Greg Laurie says that's no excuse for prayerlessness. Let me ask you this. How much time do you spend on social media every day? So don't say you don't have time to pray. The fact is you will make time for what matters to you. This is the day when the lost are found. This is the day for a new beginning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Again you hear all the angels are singing. This is the day, the day when life begins. Imagine if the richest man in the world slipped you a piece of paper and said, here's my cell number. Call me if I can ever do something for you. And then you hear a sound. Oh, it was your jaw hitting the floor. Imagine, what an invitation. Well, today on A New Beginning, we'll see we have an invitation from God Himself to come to Him anytime in prayer. No cell phone required. Pastor Greg Laurie is offering insights to help encourage us straight from the truths in God's Word. starting a brand new series that I'm simply calling Refresh. Things we must not forget as Christians. And in this message, I want to talk to you about the refreshing power of prayer. Am I talking to somebody right now who really doesn't know how to pray at all? You know when we are with our little children before they go to bed, sometimes they'll say, kids, Say your prayers. Remember, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Is this a good prayer to teach to a child? (laughs) Are you not saying to the child, now listen, you may die in your sleep tonight, and I just pray that God takes your soul. Really? (laughs) So we'll say, remember to pray that prayer. Sleep tight. And don't let the bed bugs bite. Oh, you're gonna traumatize your child. No, we don't need to teach our kids prayers. We need to learn how to pray. Do you remember the first time you ever prayed it? It's kind of awkward. It's a little scary to pray out loud, especially in front of other people. But let me ask you this. Do you remember the first time your prayer was answered? How wonderful that was? In light of this, why don't we pray more often? Why do we put off prayer? Why do we avoid praying? Well, let me offer some observations about that. Maybe we don't pray more because we think we don't have the time. But is that really true? Let me ask you this. How much time do you spend on social media every day? The latest research says people in the U.S. check their Facebook, Twitter, and other social media accounts 17 times per day. That's once every waking day. Hour teenagers spend nine hours every day consuming media, and you see people doing it constantly. They're they're walking across crosswalks with traffic on both sides, looking at their phone, not even looking up. They go to a restaurant where apparently we're there to have a nice meal and socialize, and a whole family will be looking at their phones the entire time. This is missing the whole point. We can waste so much time doing it. Imagine if you prayed 17 times a day instead of checking your phone. Someone put it this way, and I quote, one of the great uses of Twitter and Facebook will be to prove at the last day that prayerlessness was not from lack of time, end quote. How true is that? Then you factor in all the time that we spend binge watching television shows on Netflix or Amazon Prime or some other outlet. We can waste so much time. So don't say you don't have time to pray. The fact is you will make time for what matters to you. Number two, maybe we don't pray because we don't think prayer is all that important. Now we would never admit that outright, but do we really think it's important? I'm telling you it's very important. In the book of Joshua is a story of the Israelites leaving Egypt and going into this 
promised land flowing with milk and honey. And you remember there was an obstacle in their path. It was the mighty city of Jericho, a huge fortress. There was no way they could bring that down militarily. But the Lord said, I'll give you that city. So they prayed and they called on God and He gave them the battle plan, which I have to admit was pretty unorthodox. They march around the cities, yell and blow trumpets, but it worked. And the walls of this fortress crashed and they took control. After that there was another little city called Ai, much smaller than Jericho. Not nearly as difficult to conquer. They didn't pray about that. They just said, hey, we took down Jericho. Ai would be a piece of cake. And they went in and were soundly defeated because they didn't pray about it. We need to pray about everything. The Bible says in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. It doesn't say in some things or only in the big scary things. It says in everything by prayer and supplication we should pray. Maybe another reason we don't pray more is because, well, we don't think prayer really works. Again, we wouldn't admit that, but that may be the case. We don't think it really works. But we have to understand what the objective of prayer is. It's not like God is a genie and He'll grant whatever wish we have. The objective of prayer is not to align God with my will. It's to align me with His will. Speaking of genies, I heard about a lady that was walking on the beach and she saw something embedded in the sand and she reached down to pick it up and it was a lamp. And, and as she rubbed it, a genie appeared. This is a true story, of course. And the genie said, Oh, Master, I will grant to you one wish. Whatever you want, it will be yours. I'm going to go big if I only get one wish. I want worldwide peace, global peace. That's my wish, genie. I want peace in the world. The genie said, that's kind of a big one. I don't know if I can really do that. Do you have any other wishes? She said, well, I've always wanted to find one good man. A man that would love me, who would compliment me, who would not sit around on the couch and watch sports and TV, who would help me with the dishes and like the things that I like. Yes, that's it, Jeannie. My wish is for one good man. The genie looks at her for a moment and says, get that map out again. <laughs> so, no, God's not like a genie. He's a father in heaven. And the objective of prayer is not to get God to do what I want Him to do. It's to align my will with God's will. Jesus said this in John 15. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. From the original Greek it would come out something like this. Jesus speaking. If you maintain a living communion with me and my word is at home in you, I command you to ask at once for yourself whatever your heart desires and it will be yours. Now we immediately gravitate toward that latter part of the verse. Whatever my heart desires. Yeah. But don't forget the condition. Jesus says if you maintain a living communion with me and my word is at home in you. <laughs> Coming back to studying the Bible, if I'm studying scripture, memorizing scripture, understanding the message of the Bible, my desires are going to change and thus my prayers are going to change as well. Pastor Greg Laurie will have the second half of his message in just a moment. Hearing about listeners who find Jesus because of Pastor Greg's teaching is so encouraging. Hi, Pastor Greg. In 1996, I accepted Jesus at a Promise Keepers event in Oakland, California, where you invited me to come down and accept Christ. It's because of your story that I found Jesus and am now part of your life because you helped lead me to the Lord. Because of that, my three sons are saved and most of my grandchildren as well. Your faithfulness in sharing the truth has changed my whole family. We're so grateful to hear of the changed lives through Harvest Ministries. And if you have a story to tell, would you consider letting us know? If so, email Pastor Greg, greg at harvest.org. Do it today while you're thinking about it. Again, that's greg at harvest.org. Well, today, Pastor Greg is offering some very practical principles on the power of prayer. Here before us now in Matthew 20 is two scenarios of prayer. And in this uh, text, we're going to find how to and how not to pray. How to and how not 
to pray. In both of the stories, Jesus asks the people before him, what is it that you want? First we're gonna look at a mother who had two sons. She loved them, as mothers love sons and daughters. And she was very ambitious for them. And she asked Jesus to give something to them that was completely inappropriate. She stands as an example of how not to pray. In contrast, we have another story of two men who were unable to see. They were blind. And they called upon Jesus. And the way they prayed give us an example of how to pray. So let's start with how not to pray. Uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 17. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. He took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes and they'll condemn him to death and they'll deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and discourage and to crucify. And on the third day he'll rise again. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. By the way, this mother's name is Salome. And the sons here are James and John. And Jesus says to her, what do you wish? She said, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one at your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. <laughs> Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink of the cup that I'm going to drink of and be baptized with the baptism I will be baptized with? And they said, we are able. Jesus said, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it's for those that have been prepared by my Father. Try to understand what's going on. Jesus is giving a detailed view of what is about to happen. He knew the future. He knew the thoughts of every person that he spoke to. And now he's saying, this is what's going to happen to me. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be handed over to the Gentiles. I'm going to be scourged. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be crucified. And I'm going to rise again from the dead. As he's sharing this with his disciples, they're just not getting it. Because you see, their view was that when Messiah came, and Jesus was Messiah, that he would establish an earthly kingdom then and there. They were mistaken in their understanding of the role of Messiah. Because scripture clearly teaches first Messiah would come and suffer and die for the sins of the world. Then he would return again and establish his kingdom. They missed the first part and only understood the latter part. So they thought he would drive out the Romans and they would rule and reign with him in positions of great power. Hence the request from Salome, the mother of James and John. By the way, James and John were given the nickname Sons of Thunder by Jesus. You don't get a nickname like that for no reason. I think if they were alive today, they would probably be outlaw motorcycle guys or something, all tatted up, you know. Kind of rough dudes, I think. Don't forget on one occasion there was one city that the disciples went to and they weren't all that responsive to the message of Jesus. And James and John, the sons of thunder, suggested fire should be called down from heaven on the people who lived in that city. Jesus is like, oy vey. Uh, I didn't come to toast people, but to save people. So you wonder, how did they become the sons of thunder? Check out their mother. Gives us a little hint. She says, I want my sons, James and John, to sit on your right and your left hand when you come into your glory. They should be thankful God did not answer that prayer. Imagine if God came to you and said, I will give you whatever you want. Just ask for it. What would you pray for? That actually happened to Solomon when he was a very young man. He had ascended to the throne to rule over Israel now that his father David was gone. The Lord said, ask what you want, Solomon, and I'll give it to you. Solomon said, well, Lord, I, I need wisdom to rule your people. The Lord said, Solomon, because you have not asked for riches or a long life or the death of your enemies, I'm gonna give you the wisdom you prayed for and I'm gonna give you all these other things as well. Is that not the perfect example of what Jesus taught us when he said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added 
unto you. So here now are James and John and their mother asking for this thing. And understand how insensitive this was. What did Jesus just say? I'm going to suffer and die. He said, oh yeah, okay, whatever. By the way, we want to sit on your right and left hand when you come into glory. This would be like someone saying to you, wow, I just came back from the doctor's office and I found out I only have two weeks to live. And then you say, oh wow, interesting. Hey, can I have your car and your house too? I mean, what? (laughs) That's exactly what they were doing. And Jesus is saying to them, hey, do you know what you're even asking for? What did Salome, the mother in James and John want? She wanted her sons to be on the right and left hand of Jesus. Salome, by the way, happened to be standing at the foot of the cross when Jesus was crucified. Who was on the right and left hand of Jesus? Two criminals who were also crucified. I'm sure at that moment, Salome said, Lord, thank you for not answering my prayer. Fact of the matter is, all prayers are effectively answered. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says slow. Sometimes God says go. Listen to this. If the request is wrong, God says no. If the timing is wrong, God says slow. If you are wrong, God says grow. But if the request is right and the timing is right and you are right, God says go. So he said no to Salome and her two boys, James and John, the sons of thunder. Why? Because he loved them. So listen, if God has said no to your request recently, don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It actually could be a very good thing because God sees the big picture. That's how not to pray. Now let's talk about how to pray. Here's a couple of guys who prayed in the right way. Go back to Matthew 20. Look at verse 29. As they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. And they cried out all the more saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. So here's Jesus still on his way to the cross, on his way to suffer. And two guys are on the roadside. Here Christ is passing by. They call out to him. Someone says, shh, don't bother him. He's busy. He has things on his mind. And they call out even louder. Actually the word translated from the Greek would be they screamed. They screamed. I guess they believed that old adage the squeaky wheel gets the oil, right? And Jesus stopped and he heard them and he answered their prayer. Isn't it amazing to think that God cares about us? I mean he cares about the things that concern us. David said in Psalm 8-3 when I look at the night sky And see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars. What is man that you should think of us? Mere humans that you should care for us. I was in Hawaii recently speaking at our church uh, there. And I went out very late at night and looked up in the sky. And I was stunned by how many stars I could see. You just don't see that many stars here in California. Just incredible overwhelming. And to think, my God, my Creator, my Father made all of that. Yet He cares about what I care about. God is never too busy or preoccupied to take time for you. Listen, if it concerns you, it concerns Him. So here were two men with a very real need and Jesus responded to the need. So what do we learn about prayer from this story? In times of crisis, They pray, and so should we. Good insight on prayer today from Pastor Greg Laurie here on A New Beginning. And he has more insight to come in his message called The Refreshing Power of Prayer. 
You know, prayer plays such an important part in our lives, in our times of crisis, in our times of loneliness or despair, in times of sorrow. But Pastor Greg, prayer is also the way we come to the Lord for His forgiveness, isn't it? Someone could pray for that reason right now, right? That's right. The Bible says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So think of it this way. Maybe you're out in a riptide in the ocean, and you can't get your footing, and you're in trouble, and you see a lifeguard. Call out for help, and the lifeguard will rescue you. The same is true spiritually. You're drowning in your sin. You need help. Jesus will save you. He will rescue you, but you must call out to him. And you know how you do that? You do it in prayer. So let me just lead you in a simple prayer, and you can pray this prayer after me. You can pray it out loud if you like. And this is where you are calling out to Jesus to save you. Just pray this. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know you are the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. Now, Lord, I turn from my sin and I put my faith in you. Be my Savior, my Lord. Be my God and my friend. I choose to follow you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, I want you to know that Christ himself has come to live inside of you. And I have a resource I want to send you. It's called the New Believer's Bible. So the New Believer's Bible is the New Testament in the New Living Translation with hundreds of notes that I wrote that will encourage you in this commitment you are making to follow Christ. There's some other materials included as well in what we call the New Believer's Growth Pack, but let me get this New Believer's Bible into your hands as quickly as possible. Here's Dave to tell you more. Yeah, we'll be glad to send it all your way free of any charge if you prayed along with Pastor Greg today. Just ask for the New Believer's Bible when you call 1-800-821-3300. You can reach us anytime 24-7 at 1-800-821-3300 or go online to harvest.org and click Know God. Well, it's a real privilege to have Pastor Levi Lesko with us today. Levi's a pastor, an author, a speaker, and a good friend of ours here at A New Beginning. He's written a number of books, and we're excited to talk about a new one, a beautiful new book called Marvel at the Moon. Uh, Pastor Greg, over to you. Well, Levi, you know, I sometimes refer to myself as an artist. I think I'm more of a, an advanced doodler. But I have to say I appreciate good art. And as I look at the art illustrations, and design of your new book, Marvel at the Moon. I think it looks fantastic. Greg, I know that you know this, that art is so important. It's how God designed us, and you do such a great job with your sketches and drawings and Ben Born Again and Yellow Dog, and and I've just watched you engage my kids and your grandkids uh, with your doodles and sketches, and I think that's a part of how God hardwired us. You know, we were created in the image of, of a creator. yeah, And that means that we have within us creativity. And when we utilize those things, art and music and and beautiful things, uh, it activates a part of us that we forget is there. And it's our need and our love for beauty, our need and our love for art. Just like we need water, we need food, we need beautiful things. That's why Jesus often went to pray in beautiful places, places of uh, mountaintops, deserts, places where he could be alone to, like Psalm 23 says, have his soul restored with running water and green pastures. Mm. And so we worked through this with this book uh, with two very talented artists, Tim Bradford and Catherine Pearson. And Catherine uh, did my previous book, Roar Like a Lion, as well. We won uh, awards for that one, Praise God. Um, and, and my kids l- got to be involved in it. So like they would send us early sketches and I would show them to my kids and they would go, mm, dad, that, that grizzly bear doesn't look very good. Or, <laughs> you know, yeah, Buzz, Buzz Aldrin's arm looks a little sideways. And so we would send the notes back. And so, you know, these are Lennox approved, Clover approved <laughs> drawings. And then we would, we would color them with the beautiful colorations and it just turned out so great. And I think that that's one of the things that I, I think really resonates with kids, not only the the, the younger kids, especially, they, they may not track with everything, the science stuff and the, the, even the scriptures could be at times over a younger kid's head, but they're going to sure look at these pictures and the stars and the sun and all those things. So everybody, you're listening to Pastor Levi Lusco, who has written a brand new book called Marvel at the Moon. And this is a great devotional book that you need to read with your children. 
or your grandchildren and teach them about Jesus. And it's based on outer space, planets, exciting things like that, but the Bible and what God has to say about all of those things he created, as well as what he has to say about our lives. Uh, These devotions are bite-sized, they're accessible, they're understandable. The book is beautifully illustrated. So order your copy of Marvel at the Moon. We'll send it to you for your gift of any size this month here at A New Beginning. And when you give a gift toward our ministry, you enable us to reach more people with God's Word and with the message of the gospel. Dave, tell them how they can get their own copy of Marvel at the Moon. Yeah, we'd be glad to send it your way just as soon as you contact us. And we so much appreciate your support. This is our way of saying thanks. Just call us at 1-800-821-3300. We're here around the clock to take your call. 1-800-821-3300. Or go online to harvest.org. Well, next time, more insights from Pastor Greg's new series called Refresh. Practical pointers coming on making our prayer life more productive. Join us here on A New Beginning with pastor and Bible teacher, Greg Laurie. The preceding podcast was made possible by Harvest Partners, helping people everywhere know God. Learn how to become a Harvest Partner, sign up for daily devotions, and find resources to help you grow in your faith at harvest.org.